Mr. Majeski's Anatomy Class Lecture, Chapter 2, Part C. So we're talking about the cell, but obviously cells have a life cycle they tend to go through. And it has been determined that there are four main phases to the average cell's life cycle. The first is G1. In G1, this is when the cell is basically increasing its size after cell division. Uh, increasing the amount of cytoplasm and the organelles within. If this is it and the cell is not going to divide again, it then enters what's known as G0. However, if the cell is going to divide again, it then enters the second phase, or S phase. During S phase, the cell also continues to grow in size and this is also when DNA synthesis occurs. Now, if you think about DNA synthesis during S phase, it is pretty um, possible to think of it sort of as photocopying. So basically you have that double helix, and each side of the helix you have a nucleotide that will bind only to one other specific kind of nucleotide. So that T's bind to A's, A's bind to T's, C's bind to G's, and G's bind to C's. So it's possible when you split that double helix in two to basically reform the second strand by using the, the older strand as a template. And then in the third phase is called G2 where the cell goes e undergoes even more growth because obviously you need to be rather large if you're going to divide in half and form two new functional cells. So G1, S, and G2 in total are often referred to as interphase. And at the end of G2, there's a checkpoint to make sure the cell's ready to divide. Finally, you enter the mitotic phase, which is when uh, DNA is separated and you get two new cells. And this has its own series of steps. So if you look at the steps of cell division, there's nuclear division, which is called mitosis, and cytokinesis, which is the actual division of cytoplasm between the two new cells. So with mitosis, often grouped into mitosis is interphase, followed by prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, and often during telophase you also have the cytokinesis to get two relatively identical cells. So in interphase, as I said already, you have DNA replication, you have cell growth and the replication of many organelles, and you also have the centrosomes uh, divide, uh, duplicate, so that you now have two sets of centrosomes. When you enter prophase, the nuclear membrane, the nuclear envelope, will break down. The DNA will condense to form chromosomes, and the centrosomes will now uh, migrate to opposite sides of the cell. And the centrosomes will then start to produce mitotic spindles, which are formed of microtubules. During metaphase, the chromosomes will line up in the center of the cell. This location is referred to as the metaphase plate, and the mitotic spindles will stretch out to the chromosomes. And also in metaphase, the uh, mitotic spindles will attach to the centromere of these chromosomes. In anaphase, the uh, chromosomes will be pulled apart with one chromatid going toward one centrosome and the other chromatid going to the other centrosome. At this point, they're no longer called chromatids, so they're now called chromosomes. So you have two copies of the uh, genetic material being sent to opposite sides of the cell. And then when you get to telophase, the chromosomes have now reached the opposite sides of the cell. Uh, the nuclear envelope begins to reform. The mitotic spindles start to break down. The chromosomes relax into chromatin state. And you also get a cleavage furrow forming between the two sides of the cell. And eventually, they will the cleavage furrow will reach all the way through, and you'll have two separate cells um, that are now in interphase. And again, it's worth to point out that cytokinesis and telophase overlap and are often sort of 
thought of as the same phase. Now, the reason why mitosis is so important, besides just regular cell division, is that when it loses control, you can get cancer. And cancer is basically caused by the accumulation of mutations in the DNA. Initially, you get, in the three stages of cancer, you get the formation of a benign tumor. These tumors are often harmless. We all have some. Moles on your skin are benign tumors. However, benign tumors can, in some cases, become quite large, which could cause health issues. The second stage of cancer is when the benign tumor becomes a malignant tumor, which is caused, again, by the accumulation of even more mutations in the DNA. And the malignant tumor will now invade surrounding tissues, causing damage to those tissues. The third stage of cancer is metastasis. This is when the uh, through the accumulation of more mutations, cells can now leave the tumor and spread to other parts of the body, leading to cancer occurring in many parts of the body. And it's worth to point out that people, uh, researchers have determined this because different kinds of cancers are, have different features than other cancers. So it's possible to tell the difference between, say, uh, brain cancer located in the brain versus say testicular cancer that is now located in the brain because of metastasis. Now, we also need to produce cells for the reproduction of the species. And this cellular division process is referred to as meiosis. And it will lead to the production of four genetically different cells. And each cell will only have half of the number of chromosomes uh, important for that species, so for humans, they only have 23 chromosomes and are referred to as haploid because of this. And these cells that we're talking about are sperm cells produced by men and oocytes or egg cells produced by women. So meiosis is a two-stage process, although the individual steps are very similar to mitosis. So in meiosis one, you have prophase with its associated features. Um, however, a difference here is that instead of having the chromosomes all just do their own thing, homologous chromosomes will pair up together forming a tetrad. So chromosome 1 from the paternal origins and chromosome 1 from the maternal origins will pair up together to form this tetrad, which would have four chromatids. These tetrads will then line up at the metaphase plate for metaphase, and during this lining up and pairing up process, it's possible for some of the paternal chromosome to switch d with the maternal chromosome, so that you now get hybrid chromosomes that are mostly paternal with a little bit of maternal material, and mostly maternal with just a little bit of paternal DNA. And this process is referred to as crossing over, and it allows for some genetic recombination. You'll go through anaphase 1 and interthelophase 1. And during this process of dividing the tetrads between the two new cells, you actually have what's referred to as chromosome segregation. So the mostly paternal chromosome will go to one side, and the mostly maternal will go to the other side. And this is a random occurrence for each of those uh, 23 tetrads so that you have a different mixture of maternal and paternal chromosomes on each side. So that is another layer of genetic uh, recombination. At the end of telophase 1, you do not have interphase 2. You do not get any additional DNA synthesis. Instead, it goes straight into prophase 2. And prophase 2 will go to metaphase 2, anaphase 2. These are pretty much identical to what you expect. Until finally, you have telophase 2, which leads to four cells with only 23 chromosomes in each cell and no um, and they are all genetically distinct from each other. So to sort of show the differences and similarities, mitosis and meiosis are both kinds of cell divisions. However, mitosis, you only have one round of division that leads to two diploid cells and these cells are all basically genetically identical to both each other and to their parent cell. In meiosis, 
you have two rounds of cell division. That, however, it skips that second interface step, and you end up with four haploid cells. And these cells are all genetically different from both each other and from their parent cell. And these genetic differences are caused by crossing over when the tetrads are formed and chromosome segregation during anaphase one when those tetrads are separated. Now, in meiosis, there can be mistakes so that you don't get proper um, migration of the chromosomes. Here are five disorders that can lead to live births. The most commonly known one is Down syndrome, also known as trisomy 21, where this individual has three copies of the tw chromosome 21. Uh, people with Down syndrome have long lives, live happy lives, um, and so forth. Another uh, just syndrome is Turner syndrome. Here, this individual has monosomy X. This person only has one X chromosome and no other chromosome pairs up with it. Then there's Klinefelter syndrome, where the person has XXY. So they have three sex chromosomes, two X's, and a Y. And both Turner syndrome and Klinefelter syndrome um, individuals live uh, relatively normal lives, um, which differs from Tau syndrome, or trisomy 13, and Edwards syndrome, trisomy 18, which usually the embryos and fetuses with this syndrome are ab naturally aborted. However, you can have some live births, but they tend not to live for very long. Next, cellular diversity. So it turns out that all of our cells have the same DNA basically. Um, so if all the cells have the same DNA, how do we get cellular diversity? How do we get smooth muscle cells versus nerve cells versus epithelial cells and so on? Well, it turns out this differentiation occurs because each of these cells only express some of the genes found on that DNA. So smooth muscle cells are expressing the cells specific for smooth muscle, and nerve cells are expressing the genes specific for nerve cells and so forth. Finally, there are a number of theories about why aging occurs that look at a cellular level of understanding this process. So one theory um, holds that because many cells are genetically programmed to divide only a limited number of times, uh, this leads to aging as these cells stop dividing. Another theory has to do with telomeres. Telomeres are sequences found at the ends of chromosomes that are just tiny repeats of the same um, few nucleotides. And over time, as division occurs, the telomeres get shorter and shorter and shorter until finally they erode completely and you start losing the important sequence in the chromosomes. Um, and so it's thought that the shortening of these telomeres and finally the loss of functioning chromosomes is another possibility as to how aging occurs. The third uh, theory has to do with glucose, which is found obviously in cells because we need our sugar to help form uh, energy. And that glucose can form crosslinks both inside the cell and between cells, and this can lead to damage to cells and stiffening of tissues, which can lead to damage to those tissues. And finally, there's the idea that mutations that accumulate in cells can lead to either cells expressing cell identity markers that are not recognized as self by the immune system or lead to an immune system that's recognizing some different uh, kind of cell identity markers which aren't actually present in the person and that these can lead to autoimmune responses and the body breaking down its own tissues. Any one of these theories could potentially be true or a combination thereof as to what leads to aging at the cellular level. I hope you enjoyed that, the final portion of the Chapter 2 lectures.